activity. So, as, as Father Schnorrick said, I grew up in the mean streets of Armonk. Um, and uh, so, my, uh, my dad's side of the family was Roman Catholic, and um, that's more or less what um, my upbringing was, but my parents liked to, to hop around a lot. Uh, my mom took me to an Episcopalian church for about a year. My mom's side of the family was Southern Baptist, so when we would go, um, and see them, uh, you know, we, we, we went there. But um, my dad would always go back to the Roman church, so I guess you could say he was a, a Roman Catholic. Um, you know, all, all, always roaming, but still would return home there. Um, I got to the point where it was uh, the year for co confirmation. At that point, I had been going to CCD, which is what, um, in, in the Latin church, if, if you're baptized, but you grow up there as a child, that's uh, sort of like the catechism pro uh, process where you learn things. It's, it's sort of like Sunday school, but it's a little more intensive. Um, everyone in my group was basically ag agnostic or atheist, and they were being confirmed, and I overheard co you know, people saying things like, I don't want to, and the parents were like, you know, your grandparents are coming out, just do it for them, you never have to go to church again. Um, so I thought, why don't I skip to that last part and just never go to church again, <laughs> um, sinfully. And I had a conversation with, with my dad about it, and he said, as long as I believed in God, I was confirmed in his mind that I didn't have to do any of that stuff. And so that was that. Um, that I was about 12 or 13 at that point, and, uh, you know, in high school, I started playing in, uh, in a metal and punk bands, and so being religious in that environment's not cool. Um, and, you know, I had my own issues with what I viewed as organized r religion, as I, uh, you know, as I explained. So, yeah, I was in college. Um, I, I stayed home for college um, for my first two and a half years of it. Uh, I went to Westchester Community College, which is in the town of Valhalla, not too far from Armonk. And uh, that's when I one day was just saying all kinds of stuff about Christianity and how bad it was and how stupid it was. And my dad, he finally had enough of it after a few years and was just like, why don't you try actually reading the Bible? And I said, all right, I accept your challenge. And, uh, you know, I did what a lot of people do. I start with, you know, the first sentence of Genesis, try to go through and I'm like, what is this? Um, and then I, I forgot how it happened, but es essentially I, I realized, let me skip ahead to the Gospels. Um, and when I did that, I was, you know, I was, oh, like, Jesus is pretty cool. Wow. You know, and um, I guess you could say I had one of those moments that a lot of people in the Protestant world like to call, like, a coming to J Jesus moment uh, and, and, and whatnot. Um, I essentially just knew eventually who, whoever this Jesus guy was, I needed to follow him wherever he would take me. Um, even though I was playing in a band whose name I will not repeat in, in, in the church, but it was pretty bad. And so I was sort of living like this double life. Um, I didn't want to go to church because I had been burned out on church life you know, when, when I was younger because of, frankly, a lot of the hypocrisy that I saw that I had explained um, er, earlier. And, um, so I just did a lot of reading. I, I did a lot of research on various Christian groups and the claims that they make. And I had a friend of mine who was my best friend since first grade who was half Greek and half Russian. His family didn't go to church very often, but I knew they were Eastern Orthodox. And uh, all I knew about the Eastern Orthodox Church was that the Easter was different and um, that we had been one church up, up until the, the 11th century. Um, but I asked my friend about it, and he said, oh, if you're not Greek, I wouldn't worry about it. So I didn't worry about it. I was like, okay, not checking out the Orthodox. Um, eventually, I transferred colleges when I was 20 um, to Middle Tennessee State University, and that is when um, you know, I started to really get into going to these groups because there's a lot of Protestant groups there. That, that is um, 
an area of the country they refer to as the Bible Belt. And Tennessee is the buckle of the Bible Belt. It's shaped like one too, actually, if, 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 if you look on uh, a map. And so everyone had their little group there. They had Campus Crusade for Christ, which is kind of like a very ambiguously affiliated uh, pan Protestant group. They had the Reformed University Fellowship. Um, they also had a Roman Catholic group as, as well. And so, you know, I would go and visit them. And um, a lot of the Protestant groups were getting into, you know, this contemporary worship stuff. And I played in a band and I was just kind of like, if you want to go to a concert, go to a concert. I mean, you know, forgive me, but I was just, I, I didn't understand that. Um, and I started to look back uh, into my past because I was like, okay, well, I came from a Roman Catholic background. You know, it claims to be, you know, the Catholic Church of history. Um, and so, you know, I would also hang, hang out with those guys. But a lot of that church in the modern day since the 1960s has also done a lot of like the, the contemporary stuff. And even the mass that I g grew up with just wasn't that dissimilar from an Episcopalian or Lutheran service um, or even some of the Southern Baptist ones that I, I had been to. So it didn't really, uh, um, I guess you could say, it didn't Im in Im impress me or it, it, it didn't con convince me to, to go back and rejoin. Um, eventually, uh, after being in Tennessee about a year or so, I had a class um, about the Bible and its origin and content. And because I did, f uh, my major was philosophy, my minor was in religious studies. And the religious studies and the philosophy d departments at most secular institutions, they take the Bible and they like to chop it up. So they were teaching us things like most of the Old Testament was compiled from five different sources. Um, you know, the, the authors we think wrote them most likely, d you know, did not actually write them. I was really into a scholar named Bart er er Ehrman who says the same thing about all the Gospels and the New Testament. I mean, he says essentially that everything is a forgery. Um, and so that's kind of like where I was at. I was, you know, I called myself a Christian, but I didn't go to church. I felt like, you know, organized religion was evil and against what J Jesus wanted. Um, so I just kind of read my Bible and argued with people and... Um, I was really good at it, too. I mean, I, 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 I don't mean that in like a bragging way, but anyone from any kind of previous background that would try to talk to me about this issue, I, I mean, sometimes they would walk away like really shattered. And at the time, I loved it. I was like, yeah, I'm so cool. But I met a guy who was a deacon in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, and he intrigued me because in class, he was the only one who ever referenced these people called the Church Fathers and cited the ecumenical councils, which, you know, I, I had some understanding of, you know, as, as a former Roman Catholic, um, I had an idea of like sacraments and saints and stuff. So I, I sort of, you know, knew a little bit of what he was speaking of. And um, I became friends with him. And when we would argue, I, I couldn't win. He, he always set up these like barricades. And I was like, I can't penetrate these walls. I was like, man, there's got to be something to, to like what he's doing. So eventually he asked me if I had ever looked into orthodoxy. I told him about my friend who was half Greek and half Russian and, and, and all about that. And so he started to send me lectures from a priest named Father Anthony Mesa, who's a Coptic priest who's down in the Washington, D.C. area. And he had um, a sermon series that's called Deal or No Deal, where he talks about uh, the early church, and what it looked like and how it worshiped. And then he goes, all right, fast forward, who still worships that way? And you know, the, the answer was basically the Orthodox. Um, so as I started to like read the Bible more, I was like, oh, they do have patterned worship. They aren't just doing whatever they want. They're not sitting around reading their Bibles and just arguing about it. And um, it was um, a long path of, deliberation, but I, I kept having orthodoxy on my mind. And um, eventually I met a guy in Tennessee where, where I was still living, whose parents had been involved in what was called the evangelical orthodox movement. 
and the evangelical orthodox were people from like uh, the campus crusade for Christ that I mentioned who were fed up with all the de denominationalism and, and everyone just doing whatever they wanted. They said, Christ promised us that there's a church. We have to find it. Um, and through their own research and prayer and, and, and wondering about, they came to the conclusion that the Orthodox Church was the one holy Catholic and apostolic church that you know, we, we, we read about in the Bible and then throughout history. Is this Gilchrist? Yes, that's the same movement that Father Peter uh, Gilquist was a part of. So the parish that my friend here was from is in Franklin, t Tennessee, which was led by Father Gordon Walker. Um, and he, he, he was uh, the priest that led that co congregation. So our, our, um, our college was in a town called Murfreesboro, which is, yeah, Murfreesboro, Franklin, and Nashville form a triangle, essentially. So... Um, there's a lot of intermingling, uh, you know, with people in those areas. So I met this guy um, through a mutual friend. It was um, a girl that I was friends with who just invited me over to watch a movie with a friend of hers. And I was like, yeah, sure. And I noticed his Orthodox prayer book. And so I, I eventually I talked to him about it. And, um, you know, I, I told him, like, oh, yeah, I, I have a friend who is uh, Ethiopian Orthodox, and um, you know, wh what he said was, oh, a monophysite. And I was like, mm, I don't think they like being called that. At that point, I kind of got cl clued into the whole thing with Eastern Orthodox and Oriental Orthodox, but it, it didn't mean much to me at that point. I just knew that, you know, that that, that, that was a thing. Um, and, well, it's funny, because that guy now would never say that. Like, since then, he's met a lot more p people from, um, you know, your side of things and but at the time I, I guess he just didn't know and so um, you know we would talk more and um, you know I went and got an Orthodox study Bible because I was into collecting Bibles I had I had a Roman Catholic study Bible I, I had a bunch you know I had a uh, all these tr translations so I was like oh cool well there's an Orthodox study Bible I should go and get it so I read the footnotes to that you know and so I, I really started to just really get into reading about or orthodoxy. So finally, the time came where I had to go to church. Um, I hadn't actually been to church in a really long time. I think in probably about eight years, maybe, other than the stuff on campus, if you consider that a church service, because you would go to a meeting for like Reformed University Fellowship or Campus Crusade, and they would sing a few songs, and then they would have their meeting. So other than that, I hadn't been to like a church to like go to church. And so um, I, for whatever reason, I had it on my heart to go and start to do that. Not just go to the Orthodox Church, but go to other churches as well. And eventually I went to um, our, the, the church in Murfreesboro, which was a mission plant of the church in Franklin uh, that my friend's family had, had been a part of. Um, and it was part of what's called the the Antiochian Archdiocese, um, which is, I guess, uh, an exarchate, you could say, of the Greek Orthodox P Patriarchate of Antioch or the Rum or Orthodox Church. Um, and so I went to Vespers on a Saturday night and I was just blown away. I mean, everything was sung. The priest was swinging that censer. You know, he was facing away from us. I'm used to the, the, them like facing us. And I was like, wow, that's like really mysterious. And then, um, you know, they were, I mean, the, the, the hymns were educating you on, on the saint and on the th theology of the church. Um, you know, the scriptures weren't just being read, but they were being used as prayer. Like, whoa, you know, and um, I was just really taken aback because compared to what was supposed to be the high Sunday of, of when I was growing up in, in the Roman church, like this was just, they were just getting started here you know, on, on Saturday night, you know, it was really just, you know, it wowed me. And so I was really excited to go back the next day. I couldn't sleep. So I went back for the morning prayer um, and then the liturgy. And so at that point, I'm just like, wow. Um, and I, you know, I met some of the people there who are, you know, now like some of my good, good friends. And um, I was like, I love it so much. I can never go back. 
I was so used to being on my own, being a lone ranger, being a punk rocker, that I was like, I can't, I can't do this. But I still would go visit other churches, and compared to Orthodoxy, they just didn't, you know, they, they didn't uh, have the same feel. And even when I went, I, I went to the local Roman church a few times, you know, to explore my, my roots, and I was just very underwhelmed. I was like, why aren't they using incense? Um, my, to be fair, the, the church I grew up attending up in Armonk, uh, which was a Roman church, they did use incense, so that's not, there are still some Roman churches that do a, a higher liturgy and, and, and whatnot, but it, it's, it's not consistent. Um, and eventually, there was one Sunday where I was at this other church, it was like Disciples of Christ or something like that, and I just felt like I shouldn't be here. I was like, I know where I need to be. And so from that point, I had been, um, you know, going to the, the parish there. I got to see a hierarchical liturgy at the church in Franklin um, and our bishop and, and tune of blessed memory. Uh, he was just on fire. I mean, he said, he, he said something that really st stuck out to me. He said, they tell me I need to be more diplomatic, but how diplomatic do you want me to be? We're orthodox, we have to tell it like it is. And so my friend, of course, was embarrassed and thought like, oh no, if that's gonna turn him off. And I was there like, yeah, speak with authority. And so I, I had a conversation with our, the, the local parish priest there and I said, I'm really digging this Orthodox thing, so I'm going to commit to at least coming every Wednesday night and Saturday night for the evening services. I'm not much of a morning person. Well, I'm pretty sure at that point I still made it every Sunday too. So um, I guess there are some things that you can wake up for. <laughs> and um, so fast forward, I, I was made a catechumen that, that fall. That's like a first step that you take if you're an adult who is con converting. And actually, what's funny is uh, on our calendar, I was made a catechumen September 30th, which in the Byzantine and in the Western uh, tra traditions, that's the feast of St. Gregory the Illuminator. So in some ways, you know, the, you know, I had an Armenian saint looking after me. Um, and then that year of college, I finished up, and then I was to be received by chrismation on Holy Saturday of that year. And um, basically, I, you know, was, I graduated from college a week after my reception into the church. So I had to think about what I was doing. And I was already doing philosophy and religious studies. And so um, I got the, the blessing from my parish priest to go out to the Orthodox Institute in Berkeley, California. So... Um, I spent the summer with my mom in Birmingham, and I had visited the churches there as well, you, you know, when I would go and see her, so it was easy for me to just kind of slide right in and, and um, you know, and, and be there with them. I started serving in the altar there, um, and so I, I got to experience that, like, fairly er early on, and um, I, my mom had had surgery, so I stayed with her that fall, and then in late January of 2014, I went out to the Orthodox Institute in Berkeley, and that was a whole nother world. I mean, I'm already fairly new to Orthodoxy, and so now I'm seeing the good, the bad, and the ugly, and the beautiful, though. So I had a lot more, um, I mean, I, I already was fairly well-traveled. You know, I had been to, uh, you know, a good amount of parishes at that point, both Eastern Orthodox and, and Oriental Orthodox, but out there is when I got to um, really like engage more and try to figure out like which, you know, where, where I was going. You know, I, I knew I had to do higher studies. I just didn't know where exactly um, I was gonna end up. And so um, the Metropolitan who runs the school, his name is Metropolitan Nikitas, um, he basically was t telling me I should go to seminary because I was always asking, oh, it's, you know, whatever, the Feast of St. Photius the Great, can we take off from class so I can go to church? He's like, no, you have to go to class. Um, we had a chapel at the Orthodox Institute, but it wasn't a full-time thing. It would meet 
Tuesday nights for uh, the Orthodox Campus Fellowship group for, for, for all the college kids. And, um, you know, it, it, it wasn't something that they, they did, like, on Sundays or on any of the, the, the feast days. So um, if I had to go to class instead, that means I just went, went to class. And so um, basically after a year there, um, that, so I, I did a calendar year. I was there from January. I, I had the summer off, and then I went back in the fall. And um, Metropolitan Nikitas wrote, wrote me a recommendation to, to go to St. Vladimir's because I, I had gone and, um, and visited there. And I'm like, wow, this place is only a half hour south of where I grew up. And I knew that there was the Armenian Seminary, too. And I looked them up, and it's like, oh, they just bought some property in Armonk. That's where I'm from. So that was crazy. Um, I actually tried to arrange a visit to St. Nurses that trip when they were still in New Rochelle, but it, it didn't work out for, for me to go there. Um, but uh, eventually I, um, I finished up at the Orthodox Institute and I had the spring semester off uh, in 2015. And so my mom had moved to Arkansas. So I was there with her. Uh, I was serving at a parish there and traveling back to Tennessee whenever I could. Or, um, and um, I got, you know, my priest's uh, per permission and blessing to go to seminary, uh, but specifically not to seek the priesthood because I hadn't been Orthodox very long at that point. And um, he thought it would just be easier for me to not have to worry about that and just do a program that's not geared towards ordination, but still, you know, st still having like a, a vibrant seminary education. Um, so I started at St. Vladimir's in the fall of 2015. Um, and this is my fourth year because I graduated from the Master of Arts program and went back for more. I, I'm in the Masters of the Theology now. And last year, when I realized I was going to stay another year, um, they informed me that they probably wouldn't have room for me because I was just an extended student, so I wasn't on the, the, the priority list. So I had been up to St. Nurses a few times. I was there at the consecration. Um, I visited them. Uh, sometimes if we wouldn't have a service, I would contact them and be like, hey, are you guys doing Vespers? And if they were, I would just go up and hang out with, with them. And so I already knew Father Martharos and Father Daniel. Um, and uh, I was like, would it be possible that I could live here next year? And they were like, I don't see why not. And so it worked out for me to live there in my hometown, right next to my high school. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm the first of the Eastern Orthodox to, to live there. And so that it's, I mean, it's been a great experience. I, I still spend most of my time down at Vlad's just because that's where I'm enrolled and that's where a lot of things are that I, 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 I need. So um, I really only experience the positive things of St. Nurses. I don't, I don't really have, have a bad time there. I, I'm not around enough for anyone to get mad at me. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, I overhear some of them, but I'm not involved in them, you know. Um, and so I've been, I don't, this, I think I have to check my list. This is like the 627th Orthodox Church I've been to. So I like to travel around a lot and visit, uh, you know, the, the Oriental and the Eastern Orthodox ch churches. And uh, obviously, because of my friend who's Ethiopian, who, who's now a priest and he's living in Ethiopia now, um, that issue, you know, with reconciliation between our churches has been a very uh, important thing for, for me. So living at St. Nurses, I think, is another bridge that is built that, that way. And, uh, you know, at St. Vladimir's, we have Syriac and Coptic and Ethiopian and Indian and Armenians, you know, who study there. So um, that's a great, um, that's a great blessing. Uh, and the fact that you have me here singing with you to the best of my ability, just from what I've heard and, you know, and everything. So um, it's just been a, a wonderful experience. Um, when I texted uh, Dare Hire to like let him know I was gonna be here tonight, he, he, he asked me if I could speak. So I didn't have anything prepared. So I thought I'd just tell my life story instead, you know, or like, you know, a short, a short version of my life story. Um, so.